and welcome back to my channel. My name is Muriel and in this video I will be going into a deep dive of episode 3 of Amazon Prime's The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. Yay! <laughs> yes, I prevailed once again. I watched this thing twice so I could take notes and report back to you all about this fantastic <laughs> fanfiction. <laughs> yes, to be very clear, I'm honestly considering this a fanfiction straight up, though since once again Amazon has decided to attach The Lord of the Rings and the name Tolkien to their product, I am still judging them as an attempt at an adaptation. It fails miserably as an attempt at an adaptation, hence it is in fact a fanfiction and not a very good one at that, but still I will be judging on that metric. <laughs> because unfortunately episode 3 then improved significantly on episodes 1 and 2, it was marginally better shall we say, but uh, the law butchering continues and the bad writing continues, oh my. So the story picks up with Arondir, our sylvan elf friend who was yoinked underground in episode 2. He wakes up in a slave slash work camp tended by orcs. Yes, we see many orcs. First off, a positive note, the orcs look Excellent. The prosthetics, the makeup, excellent. They are not CGI, they're what they should be. Honestly, they look as if they were lifted straight out of Peter Jackson's original trilogy. And I think that's a good thing because those are just very well realized orcs. So Rondi wakes up and he's prodded into this very small clearing by a ginormous tree with ginormous roots and basically told to start working. And then he realizes that uh, <laughs> the mates from his occupation squadron are there as well. You're given no explanation as to how or why they were captured. But they're all there, his buddy and his warden leader type dude, I don't remember any of their names, but they're all there and very dejected and it's like, well, we're in the shite, aren't we? I mean, I say they're dejected, but of course already they're trying to figure out how they can escape the situation. And Aronde also hears a name being mentioned by the orcs, Adar. Then we zap back to Gally and her boy toy. <laughs> Oh yes, I'm just full-on snark mode and taking the piss mode. Galadriel is not Galadriel, so for this show I'm just going to call her Galley. And Holbrand I'm either going to refer to as Holbro or Boytoy, because it's very bloody obvious they're pushing for a kind of romance or ship between those two, because in this timeline Caliborn doesn't exist and Calabrian doesn't exist, so Galley is free to get some human ass. Speaking of ships, they are in fact on a Numenorean ship, because last time we saw them they were passed out on that raft and they got picked up by a Numenorean ship. So they're in the hold of this ship, Boytoy gives Galley a little meal, they have a bit of an exchange, then the trap door is opened and they are brought on deck and they are faced with the captain of the ship and Galadriel does have a rope in addition to her nighty, and she asks where are you taking us, where are we going? Does she really have no inkling? Again this is Galadriel, you would think she'd know about Numenor, that would be a, an educated guess, but nope. And captain of ship does not want to answer her questions. Boy Toy Harbro also asks where are we going and captain of ship says home. Home being in fact Numenor. So you come finally three episodes into Numenor. And Numenor in all fairness, is quite beautiful once again. They managed to render Numenor in a very beautiful and convincing fashion. I will also give a point for the costuming of the Numenorians. So far I find it's the best costuming or costume design. And Galadriel explains to Boytoy what Numenor is and gives a little bit of background info. I just have to note this as well. They really are pushing the rolled R's in this show, which is kind of funny. I mean, I like accurate Tolkienian pronunciation, but they're really pushing it. Like it's Galadriel, it's Morgoth, it's Numenor. <laughs> I'm like, okay, we get it. They arrive in Numenor and then they're basically brought in front of the royal court. And Boy Toy Halbro has already figured out that Galadriel is a bit of a bitch. <laughs> He's telling her, look, just don't aggravate these people, just stay calm and diplomatic. But 
Nope. <laughs> They're brought in front of the Queen Regent, Tom Muriel. Now, if you're familiar with the law, you'll already have noticed an issue with that, but I'll come back to that in a few seconds. There's her counselor, Farazon. Not yet our Farazon, but okay. And so she asks these two people, who the hell are you? <laughs> because the thing is, the Numenorians haven't been to Middle Earth. Which again, huge lore issue, but I'll condense all of that just in a few seconds. Elves are seen as bad by the Numenorians. Elves haven't come to Numenor in decades, centuries, and all the Numenorians are basically giving the stink eye to Galadriel because elf ears. And so Queen Tamira is like, hmm, you're an elf, and who exactly are you? So Gali says, I am Galadriel, descendant of the Golden House of Finarfin. True. That's actually accurate. <laughs> accurate. And then Boy Toy next to her is like, I'm just some dude from the Southlands. And then Galadriel just goes into full bitch mode. And between her and Tal Muriel is this, what I'm gonna call bitch off, because both of them are just acting so uppity and aggressive towards one another. From the Queen Regent, I can kind of get it though. It's not really in keeping with the little of her character you learn about in the source material, but okay. okay. Gally's like, so, um, Captain Dude saved us from certain death. So, jumping into the ocean was certain death. So you are a confirmed abject moron. Is that what the takeaway is? So Gally is in fact a moron because she jumped into the ocean knowing full well that it was certain death. And then she's like, so uh, I need a ship to get back to Middle Earth. And of course, because I was taking the piss out of this, I was like, can't just swim there. <laughs> But no, it was sudden death. And Queen Tom Muriel is like, no, we haven't given a ship to elves in a very long time. You should stay here. Blah, blah, blah. And Halbro is like, I mean, this is a nice opportunity. We could live in peace here. It's like nice. It's paradise, blah, blah. So the deal is you stay here for three days and we will reassess the situation in three days. Also, I should note that this whole time, Gally has, has been in her nighty. So you know the nighty she wore on the boat? to Valinor, has been in that thing for, what, four days? She did receive a robe on the ship that brought her to Numenor, but then what, they took it away from her and they're just like, go in front of the queen in your freaking nightwear. And I'm like, barefoot in her nighty. I was like, can you have given her a robe? Like, fuck's sake, okay. Before moving forward, I must address the law butchering act two. There's several things wrong in this picture. And once again, I'm left wondering, why did you people do it this way? Once again, I know, and I don't really care, but I know, yes, they can't touch the Silmarillion, they have access to the appendices and the Lord of the Rings, but they are conveying information in the show, and this information they are twisting around however they want. That's what pissing me off, because I don't understand why they are making the changes they are. Give me a fucking explanation, because I don't see a good reason for it. So first thing, imagine, if you will, this is the Legendarium timeline. What the showrunners are doing with it is basically putting it into knots and then ripping it off in several pieces and just like, there. That's the timeline. There's this insane amount of compression, which they didn't have to do. They could have focused on a much narrower strip of that timeline in the Second Age, but they chose to just cram a shit ton of events into the span of a five season show. Assuming it doesn't tank. <laughs> because the thing is, Queen Tamiriel, Ar Farazon, Elendil, and Isildur, which are in this show, I'll get to them in a few seconds, that shit happens way after the forging of the Rings of Power and after Sauron has made himself manifest again. Here, Sauron hasn't showed up yet. The Rings of Power haven't been forged. And here we basically have the end of the Numenorean dynasty being shown on screen. <laughs> so, <laughs> you basically have people, what, a thousand years before they should be there or 500 years. I'm sorry, I don't have the exact timeline in mind. But yes, th there's just insane time compression happening here. So once again, this is fan fiction. This is not adaptation. Galadriel does mention that the Valar gifted Numenor to the men who eyed themselves with the elves against Morgoth. So the Valar are in fact mentionable, but they were not mentioned in that intro, and Morgoth was never said to be himself a Valar or part of the Valar. Now, is he technically said to be part of the Valar in the Silmarillion? I can't remember exactly, but he is also technically kind of god. Sauron is a lesser deity. He's a Maya. So again, you can mention the Valar, but you chose to Butcher that intro and that first age lore just for kicks? 
I was really pissed the first time I watched that episode because it just, this shit is just continuing for no fucking reason. Queen Tamiriel should not be Queen Regent while her dad is still alive. Tar Palantir. Because he is in fact still alive. Normally, he basically dies. She should be the heir, yes. But then, our Farazon, her cousin, basically force marries her and takes over and he becomes corrupted by Sauron. And Sauron convinces the Numenorians to basically reject the worship of Eru Ilvata and the Valar, if you will, and the try and go to Valinor because he's like, you, know, you don't have to be mortal. You can be immortal like the elves. You, you go to the gods and, and tell them what's what. And basically trying to convince them to worship Morgoth and the bad juju and the evil stuff, etc, etc. And of course, Arpharazon and his king's men reject the elves because the elves are aligned with the Valar and so they reject all that goodness and that light and then they kind of cut off ties with the elves of Middle Earth and the elves of Tall Eresia, but Tall Eresia doesn't exist here. Also, the Numenors have a fucking empire, basically a maritime empire in Middle Earth. There are the black Numenorians who do horrible shit in the lands of lesser men and yeah, they don't do nice things. It's actually a pretty accurate representation of an empire. None of that. The elves and humans on, I mean, the humans of Numenor have bad relations because, I don't know why, they haven't given a reason why it's like that now without all that other hugely important context. That's the thing too, Tar Muriel is part of a faction called the Faithful, and the Faithful, as you might imagine, have stayed faithful to the worship of the great god, Eru Ilvata and the Valar, and they are still friends to the elves. Now, to be fair, I have read that maybe she's actually hiding the fact that she is part of the faithful because plot and politics, we shall see. So I will reserve some of my judgment there, but as it is presented in episode three, it doesn't make a lick of sense. After that awkward just face off in the royal chamber or audience hall, you have once again Gally and Boytoy kind of have this little exchange and Gally basically takes her little sword dagger thing out of Boy Toy's belt. Though ship captain had it, I don't know how Holbro got the sword, but whatever. And they go off and then Tarmiriel and Afarazon have this little exchange about ship captain. Ship captain is Elendil. The thing is, Elendil is just a ship captain not the Lord of Andunia, a hugely important family in Numenor who are themselves descended from Numenorian royalty. And they are the ancestors of the Gondorian line, of fucking Aragorn. All that stuff is just a ship captain who once came from a noble family. And then we are introduced to his son Isildur. Isildur here is in basically naval academy. <laughs> you have this whole scene that not much happens. You see him on a ship being trained with other youths. Though at one point he kind of looks towards a mountain, I'm assuming that's Meneltama, and he hears a whisper saying Isildur. Goes back to the beach with his bros and <laughs> this is a weird moment. Again, the cheap aphorisms kind of make a comeback where the trainer basically says, the sea is always right, watching the ocean, and then they all repeat, the sea is always right. And then you're introduced to Isildur's sister, invented character. Arian, she's called, and there's an exchange between them. Okay, whatever. Moving on, you then see Nimloth in, well, one of the Numenorean palace's courtyards. Nimloth being the royal tree and the ancestor of the White Troop Gondor. Minor nitpick, I thought Nimloth looked a bit wee. I expected a bigger and more majestic trees given how important trees are <laughs> in the legendarium. You see Tarmiriel who goes on this thing about like when the white leaves of the tree fall, that's like the tears of the Valar falling and the Valar is, you know, looking upon us and judging us. And I'm like, actually, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually the Valar are pretty hands-off, they're like chilling in Valinor, they only interceded when the elves were basically being massacred by Morgoth at the end of the War of Wrath. Otherwise they're like, we don't give a fuck, y'all deal with your shit on your own. So not quite accurate, but fine. And so she brings in Elendil, and there's this also pretty awkward exchange, because she's all like, why did you rescue that elf? Also, your name, it's an uncommon name, Elendil. Never mind that one of her own ancestors was called King Tar Elendil, but I mean, in Game of Thrones, they have the noble people just study this shit in the royal houses and their families, but I guess that's beyond the, God, that's gonna sound so mean, sorry, the uh, mental faculties of a Numenorean royalty. So anyway, she asks, oh, Elendia, what does that mean? And then he says, oh, it means someone who likes the stars or some shit. And then she says, oh, but it also has a second meaning, doesn't it? It means elf friend. Ooh, you're very suspicious. And he's like, well, but the sea brought her to me and the sea is always right. <laughs> 
<laughs> and she says, but um, the sea can't commit treason. So apparently being a friend of an elf is treasonous. Again, that makes sense for the king's men, not for the faithful. She is part of the faithful. So again, moving on, maybe that's smoke and mirrors, whatever. And she's like, okay, you'll basically keep an eye on Galley. And she gives him a fancy sword. Some people have said maybe that's Narsil. We shall see. Then we are back with Arondir and crew in the work camp. Arondir is like digging in the ground. And he notices that one of the orcs is out in the sun and is being burnt by the sunlight. This is something I liked. Yes, I like that because yes, the orcs should be sensitive to sunlight. They are creatures of darkness after all. So he sees the orcs scamper back under this tent thing that covers the tunnels basically they've dug through which Rondi, you know, was going in episode two and got dragged into. So they have this tunneling system going around in the region. So Rondi takes notice of this. Then he has a bit of a chat with his commander, with his buddy, whose name I've forgotten because I don't care. And they're like, yeah, they mentioned a name Adar and Adar is an elvish name. In fact, it's a word for father. That's what it means. Father can come up with a more interesting name, I guess. Anyway, moving on. So Adar, could that be a name for Sauron? Does that mean that Morgoth has a successor and I'm like wait but shouldn't y'all bitches know about this you are an occupation force in the Southlands in Harad presumably you're there to keep an eye on the populace and to make sure Sauron doesn't pop back up they're on the orders from Gil-Gilad and Gali was under orders from Gil-Gilad convinced that Sauron was out there for centuries do these people not talk to one another? Like, what a shitty chain of command then. Because I'm like, what were you doing there in the first place then if you didn't think somehow that, yeah, there might be successors or a successor to Morgoth? Like, hello? And then the orcs get pissy about this. They're like, oh, you lot. Um, elves, stop talking, get back to work. And they're like, there's a big fat tree in the way. We can't dig through the tree. We have to dig around it. It's going to take time. That's basically the commander. And he's trying to be somewhat diplomatic. And the orcs, being orcs, don't take kindly to this. <laughs> and he's like, I'm gonna rip the flesh off your back. But then big honcho orc comes along. He's like, hold up, hold up. This dude is obviously worthy of some respect and consideration. He's like, he gives him a water jug. A bit weird, but water jug is like, you've earned yourself an extra ration of water. Good on you, mate. And he's like, go on, drink. So commander takes a swig of the jug and okay, it's not poison. He gives it to a rondier. A rondier takes a swig. Then he gives it to his buddy. <laughs> and as Buddy is about to take a swig of his own, oh, guess what? The leader orc basically swipes at his neck with a sword and Bud dies. <laughs> and okay, th again, this is kind of a minor complaint. I guess it's because it, wow, well, it's a family friendly show, but there's some pretty gory stuff that happens towards the end of the episode. So I'm like, because mm, the dude gets sliced on the neck where was the arterial spray? Because basically no blood comes out. I mean, just a tiny little bit of blood. I'm like, come on. He should have been just geysering blood out of his artery. I was like, maybe elvish circulation doesn't work the same way. And then clearly the show is trying to make you feel the heavy emotions of the situation because there's like this poignant grave music that starts playing, kind of like some of the themes in The Lord of the Rings. I want to note here that uh, the music has kind of grown on me and I really love the theme for Numenor and more generally the music just worked way better so I will give points for that. However I will agree with other critiques that say sometimes there's too much music sometimes silence would do more like you know there's the scene in Lord of the Rings where Aragorn just loses his shit because him Legolas and Gimli have lost Merry and Pippin and he just screams to the heavens and kicks a helmet and it's silence and that was way more powerful. So there's this grave music playing and Arondi is like no my buddy has just died. <laughs> So he's all sad about his buddy dying. The thing is, it doesn't work because one, there's usage of slow motion that isn't earned. There's quite a bit of slow motion in the series that shouldn't be there. And I'm like, I saw this dude all of two to five minutes in the first two episodes. Your friendship and relationship to him has not been set up at all. I feel nothing here. Am I really supposed to believe you care that much about this guy dying? I mean, it's sad, sure, but like, okay. And this all basically came about because Arondia didn't want the tree cut and his commander didn't want the tree cut. It's like the tree's been here for like thousands of years. You things crawled out of the darkness way more recently and you have respect for the trees. That I like. I want to be very clear about that. I actually like their attitude towards this tree and towards, you know, life. That is very elvish. And then Ron is like, fine, fine. 
I will cut the tree, don't kill anyone else. So he takes an axe and he climbs up and you can see it's actually really tearing him up inside or maybe I was just projecting my own love for nature and biases onto it, I don't really know. But actually, I want to say this, Arondi is my favorite elf so far. He's like the most elvish elf to me. He's grown on me somewhat. And so he climbs up to this tree and then he looks around at the landscape and it's been devastated. Think back to Isengard and the forests being cut down. It's kind of that general idea, though big convenience that that one big tree <laughs> was still standing. Plot contrivance a wee bit. But so he puts his hand on the tree and he, he speaks to it in Elvish and you can clearly tell he's very upset by this, this beautiful majestic tree who must be like a thousand years old, but he has to cut it down to save his uh, squadron. And that was a good scene. Again, I will always give credit where credit is due. I like that scene. That was properly Tolkien Elvishness, just reverence for nature and living things and the goodness in living things. So I like that. Back in Numenor, Gally has fight Finally found some new clothes. <laughs> And she's basically escaped from whichever set of rooms she was being kept in in the palace at Numenor. I don't know. But she's out in the street. She's kind of doing a bit of ninjing on the cornices and stuff. And then she drops into the street and I'm like, I'm going to find a boat and hightail it out of here. Of course, as she's about to make for a little boat, Elendil is like in a corner just standing. And he's like, well, that's not a really good boat to escape. And anyway, I can't let you escape, I'm afraid. And I want to say this as well. I really liked Elendil's performance. Probably my favorite with Arondia's. His character just feels like it fits the Legendarium. I can't really explain it otherwise. So Elendil's kind of trying to, you know, keep an eye on Gally and Gally being the bitch she is in this timeline, in this fan fiction, instead of, I don't know, being diplomatic, of staying chill. No, she goes full teenage aggro and is like, I'm gonna shank you, bitch! <laughs> <laughs> I'm exaggerating, of course, but she takes out a little knife. This is, um, this is my version of Sting. <laughs> Thought I'd take it out for this. So she's like, I can kill you, mate. I can kill you and take a boat and leave. And he's like, yeah, but you know, those guards over there, they'll just drag you back to the palace and you'll be chucked into a room. So not going to get very far with that. And she's like, you don't know who I am. I'm Galadriel. <laughs> I'm a respectable elf. Haven't really proven that yet, but all right. <laughs> Okay, that's kind of a stupid exchange, or I mean a stupid line on his part. Because Elendil says, I look into your eyes and I see my children's eyes and my daughter's... What was that whole thing? One of my children runs too fast, the other runs blind. And I see that in your eyes and I'm like, bruh, bitch is like 2,000 years older than you and your children not... That bit of condescension, whilst it makes sense given Gally's abysmal personality, also feels weird given that she's supposed to be Galadriel and an elf. And then she's like, well, you people hate me anyway, and I'm in a place where everyone hates me. <laughs> and Elendil starts spewing some elvish at her. Well, actually, some of us are still friends to the elves. And she's like, mm -hmm. and she replies in elvish. She's like, oh, do you speak elvish? And he says, yes, some of us in this country still hold to the old ways and to the friendship of the elves. And in fact, all of us learn elvish from the whole of law. And she's like, the whole of law? Do tell me more. Now, I do find it a bit ironic that they have a whole of law in the show. I'm like, maybe the writers and the showrunners should have consulted the documentation in the hall of law. <laughs> anyway, so he's like, okay, fine. It's about half a day's ride from here. And she's like, ride, you said? And then you finally see some horses <laughs> in the show because before that, everyone's basically been teleporting everywhere. So they're riding across the countryside. Very pretty. And then they start riding on a beach. And one of the weirdest looking shots, scenes, what have you ever, uh, or maybe not ever, but what was that? So it kind of zooms in on Galadriel's horse, beautiful horse, on its hooves, and then on, on its like chest with the bridle, and then moves up and you see the horse's head, and you see the cloth of Galadriel's dress with all these little beautiful arabesque type movements in ultra slow motion. Some of the camera people have a fetish for slow motion in this thing, I swear. But this it was like uber slow motion and she's riding on this horse and then she smiles first time you see her smiling in this thing but it looks so off like it's full-on uncanny valley it wasn't endearing at all it was like yeah. <laughs> 
I swear, it's horror movie material. I would expect that kind of, it's, it's kind of a beautiful shot in a way. It's very aesthetic. But I'd expect that in an A24 horror movie. Not in this. It felt so out of place. I don't know what they were thinking with that. Like, what the hell? She looked so weird. Also, why is she so happy at riding a horse? Are they trying to make a callback to Gandalf calling Shadowfax out of the wild? Was that what that was supposed to be? Because Zero said up as to why she would be so giddy at the idea of riding a horse. Just saying. She's just so ecstatically but creepily happy at the same time. I was like, what is up with that? <laughs> and then we move back to Boy Toy Halbro, who apparently is very good at smithing. Now there's a point where he looks into a smithy and some people say, oh, not subtle hint that he might be Sauron because Forging of the Rings. I don't freaking know at this point. We'll see. And then he goes into an actual smithy and he wants to be a smith. But they say, no, you have to be part of a smithing guild for us to hire you. Sorry. And then you see him having lunch at a tavern. He's eating mussels. Okay. And then a bunch of smiths at a neighboring table trying to start trouble basically and they holler at him and like you stranger what's your name and Holbro is like well it depends how close you are and aren't you the elf friend well not that friendly with her and like yeah you've been profiting from being a guest here and eating our food what next will you take our lands and then Holbro tries to be a smart ass and says maybe I'll take your women too and they're about to have a brawl basically but then Holbrand basically says I'll buy everyone another round and everyone has drinks it's all merry. And all of that was basically a ploy so Halbrand could steal a brooch representing belonging to a smithing guild from that one dude. And he leaves. He's like, I'm gonna quit while I'm ahead. Goes into a little alley. The four dudes are like, they figured out what happened. They corner him in the alley and, well, they attack Halbro. <laughs> and then, um, Halbro hawks out. Like, he's just just goes apeshit and then just destroys those dudes. He breaks a guy's wrist, he shoves a dude's head into a wall. I'm like, whoa, where did that come from? And then he gets arrested by Dominorian guards. So there's that, and he's chucked in jail. Then zipping back to the Hall of Law, which the showrunners should have consulted, and we have Gally and Elendil walking about rocks with scrolls, it's quite pretty. And she's like, oh, I didn't realize this library type thing was founded by Elros. So Elros is finally name dropped. And Elendil was like, oh yes, you knew him, didn't you? I said, well, I, yes, he was an extraordinary spirit, but I was much closer friends with Elrond. I'm like, really? With how bitchy you were to him in the first two episodes? I So basically Elendil talked to the librarian. And he was like, we would like information about this symbol, basically the mark of Sauron. And he comes back with documentation. In this documentation is like this piece of, I don't know, parchment. Apparently it's the report from a human spy into the Southlands or something that says basically the mark of Sauron is a map to where he's holed up and it talks of a basically plan B of what to do were Morgoth to fall which is what happened and I'm like first off so that mark of Sauron was a map why <laughs> Why would he brand a map to Secret Lair onto Finrod's body? See what I mean? The writing, though, it's like they change their minds mid-script about what something is going to be. It's just plot contrivance or convenience after plot contrivance or convenience. Or, I mean, maybe scriptwriters don't talk to one another because ooh, how dumb is it to, to put a piece of your secret plan on a dude's body that will be seen by his family members? I'm just saying, okay. And also, Gally's reaction is like, oh my god, it's worse than like. Expected. Sauron wants to create a land dedicated to evil. And I'm like, but isn't that what you thought would happen though? You've been chasing him on a revenge quest for what, a thousand years at this point? So doesn't this align exactly with what you were expecting? See what I mean? It's like the retconning <laughs> the character's reactions like mid episode or after one episode. It's so weird. To me, that's bad writing. I'm sorry. And then you have this dramatic music playing showing the map where I think Mordor will be. And it's like, see, that was again, excessive usage of dramatic music. It was not necessary. It was a bit forced there. And then we go back to the dirty country bumpkins. <coughs> Sorry, the Hartfoots. You see them basically coming down this little hill and they're having this kind of little ritual right before migrating to the whatever season grounds. And they're having this procession with Lenny Henry in the front and they're saying, no one strays from the path, no one walks alone. And they repeat that ad nauseum. You have Nori who wants to figure out what's the constellation that big 
hairy dude was looking at because he was looking at a constellation via fireflies he placed there. So she tries to steal a star chart from Lenny Henry and shenanigans with that. She thus steal the star chart. You learn that her dad basically sprained his ankle and so they're worried that they won't be able to keep up with the caravan when the migration starts. And then you learn that the Harfoots have a really fucking dark side <laughs> because for all their talk, of no one strays from the path and no one walks alone, if you cannot keep up with the caravan, you will be ditched and basically left to die. Nice! I mean, wow, that, like, that just took the darkest of turns. And so basically Lenny Henry gives this address during a kind of remembrance ritual for the dead and the left behind and he lists all these people. And the response from the crowd is basically, we wait for them. But I'm like, your bitches clearly don't wait for your injured or your weak or your sick. You abandon them on the road. Like, what the fuck, though? That was an interesting total shift. I'm like, okay, don't, don't piss them off, I guess. And then Big Harry Dude, the stranger, as he's called, shuffles into that clearing. He looks at his star charts. He's like, ooh. Oh, I rec- I mean, he doesn't say anything, of course, but he's like, oh, I recognize the constellation. Of course, he moves a bit too close to a cooking fire. And what you all know would happen, happens. He basically gets excited, the fires flare up, and then his star chart catches fire. He freaks out, and then he just <laughs> stumbles into a food stall or something, and he crashes into everything, and the Harfoots are terrified, like, ah, there's a giant! <laughs> They all hide for a hot minute, and then he's kind of stuck there, covered in tenting or something. And then Nori's like, oops, I might notice, dude. And then there's this scene where Lenny Henry, apparently is the, I don't know, tribe chief or something, says, you've lied to us, you've hidden the, the big hairy dude, you've taken risks, you put all of us in grave danger, and we will decaravan you and your family. And her family's like, oi, that's a bit harsh, she's still a child. Apparently she's a child, so she's not a young woman, in fact. She is a child. She's a child. Like, she made a mistake. She was trying to be nice. And Nori's like, but I was trying to help. He can be our friend. And the half of elders say, friendship doesn't matter. Survival matters. And Nori's like, but without friendship, what's the point of anything? And I'm like, you, you do have your family members and friends among your tribe. The does that count for nothing? All right. So she's trying to defend Harry, dude. And he's like, please, please, please. No, our family, take us with you. So Lenny Henry's lenient. And he's like, all right, but you'll be at the back of the caravan, which is very bad for that family because the dad has a sprained ankle and can barely pull his weight. So they might be left behind in the caravan. And apparently in half a culture, if you can't keep up, you can just die. <laughs> <laughs> you miserable sods. Then we move back to Elendale and his two kids for a little slice of life family moment. I guess they're at an um, outside tavern type thing. Elendil talks to his two kids then and he's like, Isildur, you're about to pass your exams for Naval Academy. And Isildur is so excited because, oh my god, you met Galadriel, the scourge of the orcs. Yeah, sure, that's what she is. That, that's what we're gonna call her. And then he reveals that he actually is not that sure he wants to be in the Navy. And Elendil actually acts like a dad. See, his performance is really good because his reactions make sense. He's like, hold up, I'm the dad. I know what's best for you. You're gonna go into the Navy. And that's a just dumb aphorism number whatever. It says, the watery places of the world will heal the wounds of your heart. The watery places? Why can you have said something like, the ocean's song will heal the wounds of your heart? That sounds more talking to me because like, the watery places. So what, if Isilda just stands in a puddle, that's a watery place? Is that gonna heal the wounds of his heart? Anyway, okay. And then the sister, Arian, is trying to intervene and Elendil being very stern and straight to Oi, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to your brother. And then Anarian's name is dropped. So Anarian, in fact, does exist, but he's AWOL for whatever reason. So maybe we'll see him later. Back to Numenorian prison, where Holbro is being kept. And Gally comes up to him and says, Oh, Halbrand, what trouble have you gotten yourself into? So already the banter is just freely flowing between them. I guess the romance is just going full swing because now they're on this first name basis and being all chummy with one another. She says, because apparently this is info she found at the Hall of Law, I guess. She knows that, in fact, you're supposed to be the king of your people. You're a Southland king. Ah, oh, bitch, they're pulling a return of the king on us. Ah, oh, hell no. <laughs> Maybe they might subvert that, because I'm pretty sure Holbro is supposed to be a bad guy. A few people have theorized he might be the future witch king of Angmar. 
Or it might be Sauron. If he's Sauron, though, it would be hilarious because in the source material, Galadriel immediately notices there's something wrong with this dude Anatar she meets. She doesn't know he's Sauron, but she knows there's something off about him. Here she's kind of lusting after him, as far as I can tell. So anyway, yes, you are the king of your people and you've ditched your people and you should go claim your lands back. And he's like, I am not the hero you seek because my people were aligned ancestrally with Morgoth. My family lost the war. And then Galadriel says, my family started the war. And I'm like, oh, for fuck's sake, you people, you can't even keep to the setup you shoved into your own bloody show. Like they're retconning their own fucking material three episodes in because in that intro, they basically say the elves left Valinor because Morgoth burnt and melted the two trees. And that's why they left. They didn't mention Feanor, they didn't mention the Silmarils or Morgoth stealing the Silmarils, but now, in fact, the elves started beef with Morgoth. Because reasons? What the actual fuck the- See, this was what I mean. Why are they writing it like this? And then you see a final shot of Queen Tarmiriel ascending stairs in a tower and she's basically going to see her dad, Tar Palantir, saying, we were expecting an elf to come and bad things are gonna happen, so prophecy, maybe, because shoddy script writing, I don't freaking know at this point, whatever. So maybe she is part of the faithful and she's kind of lying to Ar Farazon, what, whatever, we'll see. Then we shift back to the Harfoots, you see them on their caravan, and of course, well, Nori's family is having a hard time because the dad is not in good shape, and oh no, they're gonna be left behind, and then the caravan moves. <laughs> and guess what? Friendly giant, the stranger, has righted the caravan, and then he comes up to the family and he says, friend? Ah, uh, not really, but <laughs> okay. So Nori's like, look, he can help us and we help him. The power of friendship. <laughs> so uh, yes, that happens and you pan out from the caravan moving to wherever they're going. And then we finish back with a Rondier and crew in the work camp. So having figured out that the orcs are sensitive to sunlight, <laughs> They basically start shoving the orcs in the little clearing, it's a tiny clearing, mind you, into the sun. And then they hurriedly try to hack at their chains. <laughs> then, this is kind of fun. I mean, I didn't mind this scene. I want to be very clear. It was kind of entertaining. That segment, I didn't mind so much because it's kind of a popcorn factor there, but it was a bit silly at the same time. And you have all these elves trying to stay in the sun. The orcs try to stay under their tent thing. <laughs> they kind of start picking up their chains, the elves pick up their end of their chains, <laughs> they're going out a tug of war <laughs> for five seconds. Okay, that's kind of funny. And then, uh, I, I guess to be fair, there were similar things in PJ's trilogy with Legolas, so I'm not gonna be too harsh with this, but again, Arondir does this thing where he runs up on the chains and jumps and cuts the beams holding up the tenting. So basically all the orcs are suddenly under sunlight and they're freaking out. I was like, I just don't like this whole thing of ninjing on, on a tiny thing like Galadriel on the sword, now it's a rondé on chains. Okay, whatever. And then the orcs are like, bring out the walk. A walk shows up. Um, so I watched this episode twice. On rewatch, even though I knew this was coming, I literally can help but laugh again at seeing this warg. It's a very violent warg. Quite gory, actually. I didn't mind the gore, but its face, though, it looked like a mutant chihuahua on speed. <laughs> what was that creature design? What the fuck? It was aggro, but I mean, it looked a bit ridiculous. It looked like a yippy dog on steroids. It was a female one, though. I did see its teeth. So, a female warg. Okay, cool. But its face. Just... No. <laughs> no, 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 no. And so it starts ripping into the elves, Arondia does a bit of acrobatics and all that stuff, you know. Fine, a bit of action. Okay, cool. He chains it up, he says, come on, run, run for the tree line to the other elves. And so the warden commander dude makes it up top, and then Arondi is about to make it up top, and he looks at his commander. Commander has an arrow in his chest, and then he receives another arrow in his back or in his chest, drops dead, and Arondi is like, ah, oh, shit. And then he's dragged back down, and he stays a prisoner. And he's about, basically, to have his head chopped off. But then one of the orcs says, no, bring him to Adar. And so they bring him to this dude, Adar father, whoever he is, and you see him walking towards the camera, but the camera is blurry, and the episode ends. 
Like I said, this episode was marginally better because I found Arondia's sections mildly engaging and entertaining with the action, and I kind of liked Elendil so far. But I mean, the law butchering just keeps on keeping on. Like, wow. <laughs> it's shitty fan fiction. I mean, that, that really is what it is, because the writing is still mediocre to bad. And the plot contrivances and you know looking at other people's takes on it the more you analyze these episodes the more you realize just how badly plotted they are how badly written not everywhere but the majority of it though it's kind of shocking in a way clearly all of the money went into the cgi kind of like season, game of thrones season eh. okay maybe not, maybe not quite that bad <laughs> one thing i want to know i didn't mention previously sometimes they do this fourth wall breaking with the camera and you'll basically get a drop of water on the lens or a splash of blood i mean cgi i assume onto the lens and so it kind of breaks the fourth wall. I am not a fan of that. I, I really don't think that's necessary. I don't know why they're doing it. Not a fan. Also, I forgot to mention that in episode two, I think when you leave the dwarves, they all gather around this chest and apparently there's something very special in that chest. Some people say that it could be a Silmaril. If it's a Silmaril, I will flip my metaphorical table. Cause hell no, 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 no. Just like, like I don't want the stranger to be Gandalf, like fuck's sake. <laughs> then I just wanted to add a little thing cause I think it's kind of funny with all the, you know, the woke stuff, just to kind of prove the point that woke stuff is bullshit. It's not actually progressivism or feminism, whatever. It's fake, that stuff. Because if you think about it. You could almost make an argument that the portrayal they have of Galadriel is borderline sexist misogynist in the sense that they've taken a great female character from an author who I wouldn't argue Tolkien was a feminist by any means. He was a fairly conservative Catholic man and there's nothing wrong with that. But he did have these really, you know, memorable female characters despite the otherwise sausage fest. <laughs> and so they took this amazing female character and made her into this bitch. This bitch whose entire personality revolves around I'm angry I want revenge. Like, what is up with that? And they both marry Sued and nerfed her. I'm not really making a case that it's misogyny proper, but it's certainly not feminist. Like, what the f Like, there's nothing to do with feminism in this thing. Like, hell no. And there's no feminism in The Lord of the Rings. I don't care about that, but I'm like, horrible main female character. It's just, I mean, you can have female villains, of course, but she's supposed to be the MC and likable. And I'm like, in what universe is she that though? And my favorite characters so far are dudes. And also I want to add, I did notice that in addition to no being on the female dwarves because I guess that's just that's just too much for normies perhaps all of the male elves but Gil Galad have short to medium length hair however Galadriel has this long flowy traditionally feminine hair and I'm like mm, you're having pretty gender conforming haircuts for your elves there very progressive again I'm not trying to say they're going out of their way to be sexist but woke feminism is not feminism like just QE motherfucking D <laughs> And one final point, I just really don't get what the point of this show is, apart from, you know, stroking Mr. Amazon's ego, because the weird thing is they are dropping these crumbs of lore that wouldn't make any sense to someone who hasn't read the source material. Like they drop Fëanor's name, Morgoth's name, the Silmarils, but of course they give zero context for that, zero explanation. So they drop those things, which won't mean anything to normies and non-nerds and non-Tolkien legendary enthusiasts. But then on the other hand, they butcher the law to an egregious degree, which pisses this is off a lot of legit fans like me. So I'm like, who is this show for ultimately? I mean, of course, lots of people like it and more power to them, but I'm just, why are you doing it this way? Just why though? I just profoundly don't get it. But anyway, that's why I kind of want this thing to go full parody mode. Just have Galadriel have BDSM sex with boy toy Halbro, have her dominatrix gear whipping his ass. Have the Harfords be cannibals. They leave their weak behind. Have them eat them. Um, have a uh, Gandalf just <laughs> wield a katana. Have the orcs throw a birthday party and dance the limbo. I'm just, I'm so over this. <laughs> But like I said, I will keep watching because apparently some of you find this entertaining. So um, see the sacrifice <laughs> I'm making for you all. It's a joke, obviously. So yes, those are my thoughts about episode three. So just a wee bit of improvement. 
But it's still basically between a 4 and a 5 out of 10. Better than a 3 to a 4 out of 10, sure, but like, still not good. So on that note, I hope you'll have a lovely day, evening, or whatever time of day you prefer. If you want to leave comments, of course, you're free to do so, or on the Discord server. Do take good care of yourselves. Thank you for the continued support, and I shall see you all reasonably soon in another video. But until then, bye-bye.